Hello, this is Joshua Walker. I'm here with a new digital initiative called Tea Time. I'm gonna be drinking some tea and talking to some top experts that are friends of the Japan Society. Today, I'm particularly excited to introduce you to Dr. Robert Yanagisawa. He's both on the front lines at Mount Sinai Hospital and also a professor there. And he's done a lot of work, not only here in the city over the last 20 years, but also uh, at 311 and has been dealing with crisis throughout that time. So thank you so much, Dr. Yanagisawa, for joining us. Uh, really, let's start with a basic question. Question. What's it been like being on the front lines? It seems like everyone is, is kind of responding in different ways. What's it like to be on the front lines in the epicenter here in New York? Sure. The couple of weeks has been a tr tremendous transformation. Um, we've been sort of uh, planning uh, slowly about the, what's, what's happening, obviously, around the world. And we had sort of thought about what might come here. But it, it's been always sort of like, oh, that's a you know, this is uh, happening in China, this is happening in Europe, but it wouldn't happen here. Um, so it was a, definitely, it was a wake up call to all of us. Uh, thankfully, you know, our administration have been working very hard to, you know, secure enough supplies, uh, secure enough, uh, you know, ventilators as that's been all, all talked about. Um, but so the, uh, I think preparation, preparedness, um, and uh, all this, uh, uh, practice um, for pandemic has uh, paid off. Um, just to you know, give you some numbers. Uh, in March 17th, um, across our health system, which we have about 3,000 hospital beds, uh, we only had about 25 patients with COVID positive, uh, and that's when we started saying, well, uh, all medical staff uh, personnel uh, should start wearing um, face masks. Uh, in hospital, uh, and that was just sort of a uh, you know only literally two and a half weeks ago that was just the start of it. Um, about a week later, uh, or ten days later, uh, March twenty seventh, we hit a thousand patients in the hospital. Uh, as of yesterday, we hit eighteen hundred patients. Uh, so the if you can imagine the number of the patient growth, uh, and uh, about four hundred patients are in ICU now. Uh, that's a, you know, entire hospital have uh, transformed into um, um, sort of a, a battleground against the COVID infections. When I listen to you talk about this being like a battleground, uh, the question I have is, what does it feel like to be on the front lines? Do you think about yourself in those ways? Or is it more like we're on the front lines as citizens uh, and you're in the background having to deal with the consequences of our actions? Uh, what do you what, what's the personal toll this is taking on you? And how do you think about uh, a crisis like this? Sure. Uh, so I'm usually uh, not a hospitalist. So I'm not usually working day shifts or night shifts in the hospital taking care of uh, patients. Uh, we're usually uh, subspecialists uh, dealing with our specific area of focus. But given this uh, massive influx of patients, uh, of course, the hospitalists are going to get overwhelmed very quickly. Uh, usually, we have about 15 medical teams, including interns, uh, you know, students, interns, residents. There, those are trainees um, uh, working with uh, attendings who, who are uh, hospitalists or general medicine experts. Um, but uh, seeing this surge, uh, we were all called in to sort of uh, support uh, these teams. We've expanded to over 35 medical teams um, across all medical disciplines are pitching in to help. Um, and then I have to sort of at least say it's, um, uh, yes, uh, it's not a really a battleground in the sense that uh, it's not chaos. It's, it's very, very controlled still. Um, and uh, anything, let's say, we can't manage, uh, there, there are hospitalist uh, team leaders who oversee uh, all of our patients every day. So uh, the, the, uh, the expertise is there, knowledge is there. Uh, we're, we're supporting sort of a more of a manpower uh, with the medical uh, staff. Um, having said that, you know, this is a, a, a definitely a, a big surge of patients. Nothing that I think we've dealt with. Even after 9-11, um, I, I actually had just started working at the hospital two months earlier. And when 9-11 hit, the entire hospital went on the emergency mode. They discharged every, almost every patient from the ER that they could possibly discharge. All the ICUs uh, uh, were emptied and ready. 
Um, but unfortunately, you know, that time there was no surge of patients that came. Uh, so after about 48 hours, we, you know, uh, took down the emergency protocol. But uh, this time it's, you know, um, uh, it's different. Uh, the surge of patients are coming and coming and hasn't stopped coming so far. Um, I'm so glad that uh, there are so many uh, volunteers coming from not, not only within the state, but across the nation. Uh, from, I mean, obviously everybody is grappling with this uh, pandemic, but uh, there are certain, certainly areas that are still low in infection and not experiencing this sort of surge. So I, I, I see a lot of medical staff from all over coming to help. And um, I, I think it's a, a really, this pandemic, um, maybe, hopefully not, but a, maybe a marathon and not a sprint. Uh, in that case, we really need to sort of, I wouldn't say pace ourselves. Obviously, we're doing our best, but we can't expect that we can continue this um, rate of um, response entirely uh, for the next uh, you know, six months. So uh, that's where I think the uh, volunteers support, uh, and I think each one, everyone in the community can help uh, to flatten the curve. You know, we shouldn't say, well, I, um, um, we can't help, but uh, each of us, um, what we should sort of think of it as a, what each of us can do to help. And that may be just a not, uh, you know, possibly uh, infecting others or increasing the you know, this is yourself, your family, and your colleagues you protect. You know, the president uh, and the administration have said this week we should be hitting our peak here in New York. Uh, we're still not sure. How do you think about this in terms of the long run? Uh, you know, I've been heartened to see that many in New York at seven o'clock come out and cheer for people like you on the front lines. But what more could we be doing? And just how do we think about uh, being in this for the long haul? Right. Um, Certainly, you know, um, I think everybody's uh, starting to experience uh, fatigue, sort of, um, you know, initially you get this sort of adrenaline rush and then uh, next to you sort of going like, okay, um, how long is this gonna, how long do you have to stay home? And um, yeah, the, and uh, I, I actually hope that the peak is either now or very soon um, and that the, um, the curve will uh, start, to, start to flatten, um, but, uh, Right now, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, so, um, you know, we are certainly prepared for the worst, but uh, uh, this, again, this, hopefully not, but this may be a, um, somewhat of a, a marathon type um, a battle. The, I, I shouldn't say battle because again, as you referred, you know, I, I don't like the refer, uh, uh, referral to, um, you know, wars or, you know, this is a, a whole community coming together and uh, fighting against the uh, virus that affects us. Um, and it's not a you know, uh, community to community battle or, uh, or country to country, it's nothing like that. So it's totally different. Um, but I think, uh, you know, um, we don't know. Uh, honest answer is I think we don't know and day to day is changing so rapidly, but uh, hopefully um, we're managing and uh, uh, of course, unfortunately, a lot of people do die um, of this condition, but uh, we're also at the same time healing a lot of people, making them be get better, uh, and many people are getting discharged from the hospital. So uh, I think, uh, um, you know, we're, we, we definitely do see uh, some light at the end of the tunnel. I know that uh, the idea of 9-11 uh, and, and a lot of people are thinking about New York right now and we have that same emotional reaction of being stuck at ground zero, being in this together, but there seems to be something different going on. All my friends from Japan are reaching out. I'm sure they're doing the same for you as someone who's been in a crisis situation. What do you tell those people about what it's like to be in New York right now? Right. Um, so definitely, I think uh, New Yorkers have uh, this sort of... Uh, uh, toughness or solidarity when it comes to a major disaster. And uh, while when, you know, in the normal situation, New Yorkers may be seen as a sort of a somewhat cool or even cold, um, but um, I, I see, especially like you mentioned that at, you know, 7 p.m., this sort of solidarity, um, and uh, it really hits us, um, those of us working in the front line, uh, really, um, you know, the thank you hits us well and that motivate us, uh, motivate us to 
uh, keep going the next day. Um, the, your, the part about what Tokyo can prepare, um, I understand uh, you know, um, many, many changes are happening. And uh, uh, um, I know uh, Koike-san um, has uh, changed the policy or, or planning, uh, disaster planning to even discharge patients uh, from the hospital who are very mild, with mild cases and then put, him, put them in the hotel. I think that's a, a fantastic uh, idea because you can't just overwhelm patients, you know, in the hospital. And, uh, um, you know, I understand the negative pressure rooms. These are specialized rooms to help pre prevent infection from spreading. These are already capped. And you can't, you know, you can't uh, um, cap those, uh, you can't keep these patients who don't have symptoms in the hospital unnecessarily. Um, so get them to hotel. Uh, of course, you know, uh, the worry is that uh, with those kind of a policy, you can't do it haphazardly. Uh, you need a lot of uh, planning, preparation, and practice. Maybe even in the base case scenario, have um, you know a doctor or a nurse on on standby at the, these hotel 24/7, so that if anything were to happen to these patients, they can be triaged. I would say even go further. Have um, you know a crash cart? Um, you know. I don't mean, you know, I don't expect them to be, you know, the, the uh, ICU, uh, but until the ambulance can get there, if they have a tank of oxygen, if they have uh, masks they can wear, um, at least some treatment they can get started so that, the, and then if the doctor's on the standby, you know, while the patient is waiting for ambulance to come, which may be also overwhelmed too, if the ambulances are, you know, having to respond everywhere, uh, that they can manage these patients who unfortunately may turn, you know, um, more difficult or sour, sour that they need hospitalization. You know, the face masks uh, have always been ubiquitous in Japan. And even before this crisis, people wore face masks because if you're sick individually, you take responsibility for it. But how do you think about this in terms of the new guidance we just got uh, about having to wear a face mask? Uh, what's the right thing to do here in terms of the lessons that we're learning from Japan as well, uh, not just in social distancing and masking, but other thoughts that you might have on this? Right. Uh, what, a, what a change, right? Uh, now, you know, I walk across someone in the street and they, they naturally divert back, by, divert to the other side of the sidewalk. And, uh, you know, taking a, you know, a usual American some, you know, hugging and cheering. And uh, so it's a, quite a difference. And I see in their eyes, their fear in their eyes too. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a dramatic change, but I think it's something that we have to get used to at least for the time being. And, uh, uh, you know, again, for the benefit of not spreading the infection, uh, because you need a, for this virus, you need a human host. It's not that a, something, it just like walks on its own and, you know, jumps on people. It needs the human to human spread. So uh, social distancing uh, uh, will help and will work. Uh, so I think it's a big change, but we have to get uh, somewhat used to it for now. So one of the questions I have for you is someone who's not only a professor in Tohoku and has been thinking about 311, uh, those of you that may not be as familiar, 311 uh, was a disaster that hit Japan nine years ago on 311, 2011, uh, where you had a triple disaster of a uh, earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. Uh, and thinking about what that did to the region, are, are there any lessons that we can learn from 311 uh, in the moment that we're currently in here in New York and more, more broadly globally? Sure. Um, right. Uh... You know, these are definitely sort of a disasters that we never expected. And uh, when when it's up on us uh, and you're struggling every day, uh, it's not easy to get through. But um, definitely one of the, I would say, lessons is that no matter, no matter when it seems hopeless, that uh, we will get through. Um, after 3.11, certainly the place looked like, you know, the whole place was flattened out. Um, and I was devastated, but uh, you know today the the roads are back, the schools are back, uh, community is back, and it's amazing transformation. So we, you know, we as a human have uh, so much resiliency that that we don't know we have it, but uh, until we go through this, something like this, we kind of pull ourselves out of it, um, and we should be uh, thinking about that. That we've gone through so much other disasters that you know, we can pull through this too. 
So as someone who was on the front lines with 311 and has seen the impact and has been working with people uh, between 9-11, 3-11, and now on the front lines of this crisis, are there any lessons we can learn from COVID or at least some good stories we can come uh, at least to make us feel better about the situation? Is there a light at the end of that tunnel? Yes. Um, so we've been doing uh, this 9-11 to 3-11 outreach, uh, basically survivors of 9-11 um, so going to support the 311 survivors. And we found that this sort of disaster, um, you know, um, uh, survivors to survivor experience really helped um, um, Japan, especially Tohoku area, recover from 311 or um, the major disaster, earthquake and tsunami disaster. Um, in return, um, why well, perhaps it, it's not directly in return, but uh, Japanese medical students and residents who came to, as a part of this sort of exchange programs uh, overseas to New York and have trained all over New York are now gathering N95 masks, them, um, paying themselves um, and wanting to send supplies to us because they are just heartbroken to see New York um, going through something like this. And this is such a heartwarming uh, experience. Um, I'm reaching out to all possible you know, collaborators um, I will be reaching out to Japan Society too to um, uh, if if this mask arrives, um, you know how to distribute, and uh, it's not just for our medical center, but all those for the uh, frontline needs. Absolutely. Japan Society stands ready to help. We're so excited to have someone like you in our network, whether it was at 9-11 or 3-11 or now this global moment where we're all feeling connected as a result of going through this together. And as you said yourself, uh, this is not against any one nation or any one people. We're all in this together. So I hope that we continue uh, to be able to get this information out. Thanks so much for joining uh, for Tea Time with us today. Uh, I hope we have a chance to talk again and we'll be supporting you every step of the way. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you.